Uh, I will try to uh, give my life's uh, story as I can recall it. Although it's been many years and uh, some part of it I'm sure will be incorrect. But I'll do the best I can. Uh, I will try to go back to my grandparent and then from there on uh, elaborate. Uh, my father was born in Minsk, Russia, and uh, as a youth was sent to the yeshiva in Vilna to study to be a rabbi. There he studied under my mother's father, who was his teacher. And in 1904 or 1905, he was told by his teacher that he would marry his oldest daughter the next day and given 400 rubles and go to America to establish himself and to avoid being drafted in the uh, Russian army to fight in the Russian-Japanese war. And that's what occurred. Married my mother in about 1905, came to America, and was met by a uh, representative of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society who uh, gave him or placed him in a position as a small businessman and rabbi in a town called Spotswood, New Jersey. In Spotswood, which was a very tiny town. He had a grocery store, a butcher store, combination rabbi and ritual slaughter and nail. He did everything. There he gradually brought over his wife, sister, brother, and my mother's brother and sister from Europe by <laughs> time payments through a travel agent. I don't remember much of uh, Spotswood because I think that by the time I was born, in 1910, they were just, my parents were just ready to move to a town called South Amboy. In uh, Spotswood, two other children were uh, born. Uh, my brother Lewis, the oldest, and my brother Morris, who died at the age of 25 with a heart condition. And as my mother tells me, she had a child almost every year, and she had a doctor named Dr. Shin, who treated her without fee. Her births were not easy. The doctor came, the children were delivered in the kitchen, and the doctor left medicine and a half a dollar besides because my parents were not that well-to-do. It was a farming community. And then they moved on to a town called South Amboy in New Jersey, where they remained doing the same thing, but 
for a very short time. And from there, they moved to a town called uh, Carteret, New Jersey, which was about five or six miles north. Carteret uh, was a manufacturing town made up mainly of fertilizer factories. It was on the Staten Island Sound, and there we remained for some time, I imagine about eight years. It was just during this time that the uh, First World War has started, and American entered, and uh, as records indicate, my uh, two older brothers, who were uh, maybe eight or nine, through an arrow were drafted into the army. However, of course, they never served when they realized that the uh, draft board records were incorrect. Uh, in Spotswood, in uh, Carteret, rather. Many things happened, and I remember many things there. First thing I remember going to school, the first day at the school, I came home and told my mother I wasn't returning to school because there was nothing they could teach me. In the town, we uh, were, uh, my sister was born, and my younger brother. Um, we learned <clears throat> the town of, Spot of uh, Carteret was basically right off a meadow and the, uh, and a river, a creek where we learned that we were four boys, and we went swimming in the creek and caught muskrats and did various things that you did in a, in a country town. The, uh, Education we got there was fair. In fact, my mother brought from Europe a teacher, a Hebrew teacher, to teach us Yiddish and Hebrew. Uh, his name was Dr. Weiner, and he eventually became a very important uh, real estate broker, or uh, insurance broker. Uh, in the town of Carteret, we uh, worked very hard, especially in our butcher store, and we delivered orders to town of uh, what is today Roosevelt, and also a little town on the other side of Staten Island Sound, in Staten Island. It was particularly difficult in the winter time because we had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and rush with the orders to the various customers. The, uh, it was very difficult to go to Staten Island in the winter because there was a only a little boat about 15 feet long that would ferry you across the river and during or the sound. However, we somehow survived that with great difficulty and uh, 
he uh, gradually grew in stature and uh, uh, during the war uh, I think my parents were the only ones that didn't get rich on uh, selling sugar which was rationed at that time and we then proceeded uh, to another town actually my father wanted to try New York City where we lasted for exactly six months because as children born in the country we could not take the rigors of the east side in fact I remember I had a teacher Mrs. Greenberg who told me that I didn't belong in the area I was too refined and could not take the roughness of the uh, kids in the Lower East Side of New York as we moved to uh, uh, Rivington Street and Christie Street, which is certainly in the Lower East Side. We had a butcher's store, but my father, after six months, gave that up and moved to a town called East Rutherford which at that time, uh, time was very small and we had our own home we uh, catered to the people in East Rutherford, Rutherford and a town called Wallington and Passaic we had a Uh, we uh, uh, went through high school in East Rutherford where I was star in the track team however I did leave out that we had moved from uh, New York directly to a town called Red Bank, which was a beautiful little town, and where we had remained for two years. But there, again, my father, who never liked to stay in one place for long, went on to East Rutherford. In Red Bank, we had very good schooling teachers were very nice to us in fact the teachers would make sure that we had our breakfast in fact when we came to school they'd wash our faces and uh, give us breakfast and if they thought that we didn't look too, so strong they would take us to doctors to be examined. There we learned how to fish and everything about farming. Teachers would, would take us out to uh, farms to study uh, farming. Uh, from there in East Rutherford of course which was the last home I last town that I lived in until uh, I reached the age of 18 my brother Louis however a few years earlier in order to help support the family took a job 
in Jersey City as a plumber's helper with my uncle Joe Gittleson, who treated him very, very badly. And my mother never forgave him for that. But I, with the rest of the family, continued in East Rutherford and uh, did get a very good education. In fact, in my French, French three class, there were only three students. And when I graduated, there must have been altogether about 20 students, 90% of them being Christian. We never did have Jewish friends because we were surrounded by Christians. In the town of uh, East Rutherford, those days, especially in the Prohibition times, we were, uh, or my father was protected by Nathan Zvelman, who was the partner of Brumfman in the liquor business. And the reason that my father was protected, because he was the only Jew, Jewish rabbi in the neighborhood, and had a beard, and was always being attacked by uh, Polish hoodlums who led or worked in certain factories there. But after I graduated, all of my friends, being Christians and all wanted to be engineers, I decided to be an engineer with them. From that moment on, I went with my friends to the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn and worked during the day in New York. At the age of about 18, after graduating from high school, I enrolled in the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn, and at this at night, with various of my friends, all Christian in. Uh, uh, and then got a job at a uh, company called Fried Eisman that began to make radios. Uh, I worked there for a number of years on the line and then quit and got a job temporarily on a tugboat and uh, then in an insurance company called the Century Insurance Company on John Street. Meantime, I continued uh, engineering school till about 1934. At that time, I uh, went with my friends to the Bell Laboratories which was owned by AT&T and asked for a job with various Christian friends. We all got the job and at the interview I got the job too and I turned around and was about to leave the building when the personnel manager asked me uh, if I was German. I said, no, I was Jewish. So he told me not to return. I uh, realized that there was discrimination and uh, there wasn't much to do about it in those days. I went home 
told my family about it, and they, especially my sister, said, why don't you stop going to engineering school and become a lawyer? Uh, during my time in engineering school, which I basically enjoyed, I started a uh, fraternity with various friends, which basically did prosper and continued until about 1970, 75, as gradually the members were dying off and uh, their original membership never really increased very much. Uh, I uh, had to, uh, in order to qualify for law school, I had to go to uh, NYU and take certain courses. Uh, as the uh, in engineering school, you didn't take the art courses that were necessary to entitle you to enter law school. After about a year or so. I entered Brooklyn Law School, which at that time was a three-year law school, and uh, I, in 1935, met your mother, who was a sister of a friend of mine, uh, Sam Binder, while working for an insurance company where I worked for seven years, I uh, uh, was also the purchasing agent for supplies, stationary supplies, and Sam Binder was the a partner in a supply, stationary supply company. Uh, one day, Sam invited me to a double date at Lewison Stadium, and that's where I met my future wife. He uh, went with Tilly, uh, your mother's sister, and uh, he eventually married her. Both of us married uh, two sisters. Uh, I continued law school and working in the daytime. In the meantime, I quit uh, my job at the insurance company, where I did fairly well in that I was able to study and not work practically. And... Uh, your, your mother was working. And in 1935, we got married in uh, Ray's oldest sister's home. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, Ray was living with two sisters and a brother. The brother got married and the sister got married. And therefore, we were left with the apartment, which was a three-room apartment, as I recall it. And Molly, the oldest one, oldest sister, continued to live with us until eventually she got married. I, at the same time, uh, entered the... Uh, import-export business through a friend of mine that I met in law school. He worked for a company called Schenker, and they imported all types of fresh meats from Poland. But, as it turned out, the shipping documents always showed about 20% less uh, than the actual shipment 
So the Shankar had all types of meats for sale, and they had no one to sell it to. So I set up a company with a uh, a fellow named Bernstein, who had been in the banking business, and another man from Poland, a Jewish man, and we set about uh, traveling particularly to the provision people in New York and Pennsylvania, where we sold the merchandise. The business as such was basically a failure, uh, particularly in that we hired a uh, salesman named Parks who gave all types of credits which we knew nothing about. And in fact, he was selling the merchandise cheaper than what it cost us eventually. The uh, uh, partner, this my partner, uh, actually went ahead and kept the business for some time thereafter. I left it in about 1939 when I graduated from law school. I could not practice because I had to get a master's degree. Uh, or have uh, one year of uh, experience in a law firm. I uh, continued law, Brooklyn Law for a year and did get my master's degree. At the same time, I worked for a law firm for nothing. As it turned out, I brought in all the clients and I wasn't able to to obtain any part of the fee. The uh, partners kept the fee, uh, that is, my employers kept the fee, fees, and your mother, meanwhile, supported the two of us. Uh, about 1940, I was all through with that and opened up a small office in 1501 Broadway. Uh, actually, I had tenants, a tenant who later moved out, but the practice was successful from the day it opened up. And the reason was that in 1940, the uh, world was in turmoil and people from all over the world had no place to go but basically to be, but to seek refuge in the United States. And through a friend of mine named Cohn, whose sister worked on Ellis Island, and my partners who knew a lot of foreign uh, people through the uh, uh, provision business, uh, I got to know a great number of these people, and in the first year, in fact, my gross income was $49,000, which was exceptional in those days in Europe. And uh, in fact, the income continued right till the present day. In this practice, I got to know thousands and thousands of people and uh, government agencies. In fact, in those days, there were no, uh, the immigration did not issue visas in the United States, a person had to get a visa out of the country. Uh, I was involved through uh, the various Jewish organizations, uh, particularly as the refugees, and my reputation spread very, very quickly. And. Uh, at that time, uh, even many the law firms 
big law firms, none of them had any immigration experience. And first thing I know, many of the large Christian firms came to me uh, with this type of business. Uh, I traveled a great deal, particularly to Cuba, where I bought uh, Cuban visas for people all over the world, but it would necessitate it going down to Cuba, seeing the sister of the President Batista with my Cuban lawyer, and gradually developed a, uh, a large practice in Cuban visas. And through this, I got to know particularly Jean Brunswick, who is a lawyer in Geneva, Switzerland, and so many refugees came through Switzerland that between he and myself, we built up quite a large practice and, in fact, began to represent people on other types of matters. We uh, had very, very many interesting things that happened in the practice. Uh, and I'll try to uh, explain some of them. Uh, during the period from about 1940 to 1946, I spent a great deal of time in Washington living at my sister's place in Washington. I would be there about three times a week. She worked for the OPA, which is the Office of Price Administration, and she was able to help me out a great deal with information there. In order to get a visa or a person into the country in those days, during the war, there was a uh, committee set up in the State Department consisting of a member of the FBI, the Immigration, Navy and Central, Navy and uh, Army Intelligence, and the State Department. And while the alien was abroad, his relatives had to appear in Washington at this board to show that the individual was not a uh, uh, communist, or a uh, undesirable person. Uh, very many odd people appeared with me, such as my friend eventually, uh, Conrad Shu, and his sister, and a fellow named uh, Lichtenstein, who was an artist. The odd thing about Lichtenstein was that he was basically su supported by myself and a man, uh, Dr. Milner, who was the head of the Stellar's Company Limited in London and the U.S. He was a very short man, about five foot, and had no visible means of support. When he appeared before the board, they asked him what he lived on. He says, well, whatever money Dr. Milner gives me. He says, well, can you estimate? He says, no. He says, I live in one room, I paint, and, uh, and that's it. Funny thing was that he was in First World War in the Allenby Brigade which was a uh, Jewish brigade set up in Israel and fought under the uh, British. 
Liechtenstein himself was a uh, an artist living in Paris for some time with uh, people like Picasso and Modigliani and so forth. But it, right before the war, they broke up because of their political philosophies. Uh, Chagall and uh, Picasso basically were communists, and uh, Wolkowitz and uh, Liechtenstein were more conservative. And both Wolkowitz and Liechtenstein came to the United States. The other ones remained in Paris. In fact, later on, uh, Chagall uh, became my client. The way he became my client was I got a letter from a uh, French doctor who I'd known, who I'd had assisted. I don't recall his name. And he wrote me about this great artist and asked me to help him. And what I did is I wrote to uh, Chagall and asked Chagall various things among them was, were you ever a communist? And he wrote me back numerous times but never answered the question. Meantime, he had been in the U.S. before and he owned property up in Woodstock. And he asked me to sell the property for him, which I did and I uh, remitted the money to France. I, after the war, visited Chagall with a fellow named Bernard. Bernard was in the U.S. as the Air, French Air Force representative in Washington and who was the owner or part owner of a uh, chain of linen stores called Boucheron. Eventually... Uh, when I went to visit uh, Chagall, I uh, was ushered into his magnificent uh, studio, which was in a city called Vence in southern France. And Mr. Bernard came in to see, came in with me. Uh, we had long discussions. And uh, he was very nice to me and told me that normally he was not so nice in that he, being an artist, had to put up an act for the general public. But after discussion about my background, my wife's background, he realized that uh, his father was beholden to my father-in-law, who was the unofficial town mayor and who owned a uh, Kretschmer or a roadhouse and had given advice and money to Chagall's parents. So he said he wouldn't act crazy with me, but he would be normal. At the end of the discussion, he said, look around and pick out any piece of uh, art you like or want. And I said, if you really wanted me to take a piece, you'd go pick it out yourself and then hand it to me. So with that, I left. Uh, Bernard was beside himself, and he says, you're crazy. He says, you should have picked out something you liked, and uh, it would be worth a fortune someday. Frankly, I was stupid or didn't know what I was doing anyhow. So we went back to Paris. Eventually, Chagall was admitted to the United States. Uh, through Mr. Bernard, I also became the executor of the estate of Boucheron, and uh, it was my job to distribute 
certain funds for uh, the estate. And I recall particularly one young lady who became a rather famous journalist who met me about 20 years later. And when she found out who I was, she berated me in that she felt that she did not get the proper uh, share of her uncle's estate. There are many, many instances that happened during the practice. Uh, those with individuals and with governments. One of the saddest situations I can recall was that uh, during the about 1944 a lot of uh, Jews were, or 43 a lot of Jews were uh, fleeing to Switzerland and the Swiss government was just pushing them back to the Germans where they were eventually killed or cremated uh, they appealed to the U.S. to take some of these refugees, and the U.S. did not do very much about it. Uh, I, while in Washington, became acquainted with a fellow named Alexander, who was the uh, liaison man between the various government agencies and the State Department, such as Congress and also the FBI and so forth. And one day, Alexander said to me that McCarran and Walter, who were the, the eventual uh, originators of the Immigration Act, told the State Department that if the Jewish agencies would agree, they would pass a law that would admit 60,000 Jewish uh, refugees from Switzerland uh, and asked me to try to get the consent of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the highest, and the B'nai B'rith. I went to see Mr. Bisgeier of the B'nai B'rith and Mr. Osofsky of the Hayas, and uh, neither one of them were very receptive in that they wanted the credit for such a bill. And I said I wasn't interested in the credit, but I would be very happy if they would meet with uh, McCarran and Walter, and they refused to do it, saying they had better friends. Eventually, nothing came of it, but a law was passed admitting 5,000 Jews because of the ego of these two men, uh, 55,000 Jews perished. There are many instances where I uh, uh, would battle with uh, the Hayas, particularly in that they had an agreement with the State Department to be able to send emergency telegrams uh, to consuls abroad to assist people in coming to America. And uh, I did not have that facility, although on many cases I told my clients how to send the telegrams, and eventually uh, the Navy intelligence did come to me and say, hey, what are you doing? I says, oh, I'm trying to save people's lives. But they said it was unlawful for me to do this, and I had to stop. Another instance during this period was that many aliens who eventually came to the U.S. would come to me with secret information and uh, would tell me. I referred them to the government, but they refused. So what I did is I prepared memorandums for the State Department and gave them to Alexander with many very confidential information. In fact, in one case, 
an alien came to me who had brought to the U.S. by a German sub with a list of people to contact who are relatives of people in concentration camps demanding ransom of the relatives here. I brought that uh, memo to the State Department also, and very quickly the FBI visited me and wanted to know why I was interested in giving the United States government information. And my answer to them was, as far as I'm, I was concerned, I was just as patriotic as they were, but I stopped giving the government such memorandums because I felt I might eventually get in trouble. In that respect, I'm sure I was wrong. Uh, now, the story of Conrad Shue is an odd one. A, uh, during the war in uh, and conquering of uh, Red, of China, a uh, Russian came to me, named Pisarevsky, who was a smuggler and who smuggled uh, watches from the Philippines or Okinawa to Red China or China at that time and various other places. Uh, he asked me to assist a fellow named Conrad Shu in coming to the United States from India who had just come across the Burma Road with General Stowell. I uh, went down to Washington and arranged for an invitation or a visa through India and uh, shortly thereafter Conrad Shu showed up and uh, he had nothing but the clothes on his back and I assisted him financially and otherwise and we became very very good friends in fact he's one of my best friends till the present time uh, to go into his life and his story would take volumes, but uh, with me he was a good friend and uh, gave me information concerning China, which helped me at various occasions, recommended many clients to me. Uh, and it, of course, during all this time, I had uh, been married in 1935, and my first son, or our son, George, was born in 1941. I personally wanted to join the Army as soon as the war broke out, and the State Department received an offer through the Army Intelligence to give me a captaincy in the Army as I would be used as a translator in Maryland, particularly with the German prisoners of war. But I had to have the written consent of my wife who refused to give it to me. The Army eventually did send me a questionnaire, and the fact that I had a son, I was never called, or uh, they just forgot about me. I just don't know. Um, meantime, we lived in a, we moved to a three room apartment on a, in the West Bronx where George was born and uh, eventually in 1947 we bought a home in Riverdale or Fielsen for $47,000 or $48,000 and had, uh, we gave a uh, cash deposit of $25,000 which was huge in those days 
and I was frightened to death that uh, that was all most of the capital we had, but uh, my wife was certainly much more secure than I was, and she was not afraid of that. And the mortgage was only $18,000, which meant very little. The uh, reason we moved there is that my wife wanted to make sure that her children, our child, would uh, be able to enter one of the private schools in Riverdale because we were residents. And our daughter was born in 1950. And of course, both went to uh, private school. George at first went to Columbia Grammar School and uh, to Fielson and Horace Mann and so forth. And Florence went through uh, 12 years at Fielson. Uh, basically, our lives in the uh, in Riverdale was rather sedate. Uh, we did help to build a temple, but somehow did not last very long there. Although our children went to Sunday school there, and we observed the holidays. But uh, my wife one day could not get tickets for her sister uh, to the temple, and uh, because of that she left or gave up membership in the uh, temple, which again was wrong, I felt. But uh, uh, getting back to uh, the practice, it expanded. And uh, uh, I had uh, uh, Morris Fellner working for me, various other people, Mr. Roth. And, uh, but Morris was taken to the Army, and he was replaced by Roth, who stayed with me for about 22 years. Uh, of course, after the war, we then began to travel a great deal. In fact, uh, even Florence, by the time she was seven, was a few times in Europe. In fact, Iran and Israel twice, uh, and various other countries. We did have make friends of many foreigners, in fact, many more than in the U.S. Somehow, we never did develop great friends, particularly among Jewish people. Just why, I guess we were both sh too shy and uh, did not continue or make a real effort to uh, continue friendship with anybody, particularly. Uh, of course, during the period of 50, almost 50 years of practice, we traveled to Europe and especially the West, uh, the uh, Far East, and during this period, we always took our secretary, one of our secretaries, with us, and developed a, uh, a clientele among the Chinese. Somehow, we never did develop the, the Japanese or Koreans or. Uh, Indonesians. Uh, among the clients that uh, we brought to this country, I think the first one 
was uh, Arthur Rubenstein, who with his family uh, were quarantined on Lullis Island because one of his kids had uh, uh, scarlet fever. Uh, Claude Rains was another one we brought to this country. It was very nice. Through the Gallo Wines in California, we brought many opera stars from Italy to this country. Um, among our other clients, uh, one of the most interesting men that we brought over was a man by the name of Kuhner, K-H-U-N-E-R. He was the only Jew at the Treaty of Bresler Tusks and became the uh, Austrian Consul General in uh, Switzerland. And at the same time, he was the president of Unilever Brothers in Paris.